All right, so we'll go ahead and get started again. Um, I want to make a quick note. These talks are dedicated to Our Lady of Good Success because without her, I would not be here. So all the credit has to go to her. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so this is part two. Confirming the dogma of the origin of Adam's body from against evolutionism. We saw uh, last time how the scriptures are explicit and tradition is unanimous that the body of Adam was formed immediately by God, by God alone. And that the matter from which his body was formed was mud or clay, dust from the earth mixed with water. We've seen that this seems to meet the requirements given by the church at Vatican I and elsewhere for Catholic dogma, something to be believed with divine and Catholic faith. Here, we're going to look at the response of Catholic theologians to evolutionism, particularly in the late 19th and some of the early 20th century, and see how they confirm what we found in part one. But then we'll also see that they were ignorance of certain very important texts in this regard. So first, a quick word about transformism. Um, this is just another term for evolutionism, oh, used interchangeably, that was used frequently uh, in the 19th century. And there are a couple different kinds. There's the absolute transformism. This is the materialist, atheistic evolution that we're familiar with. But then there's also this mitigated or limited transformism. And this is more the theistic side, or what is advocated as theistic. And this is in two kinds. There's natural transformism that God somehow used an evolutionary process to bring about the human body, and then once it was ready, he infused the human soul. Or there's the special variety of transformism, that God still used that evolutionary process, but couldn't quite get there, so he had to miraculously change the body of a subhuman primate into the body of the first man, and then infuse the soul at the same time. Um, these are important to understand because our thesis is crafted to refute both of these. The immediately aspect of the thesis refutes natural transformism, because it says that no intervening secondary causes were present, only God. And then the mud of the earth reflect, refutes the special aspect, because it says that no, the sense in which the church has always understood things is that it was mud. It was the earth that has the proximate matter. No subhuman primate here. So, in the 19th century, there was kind of a mixed reaction to evolutionism. Um, I think we're going to hear more about as this week progresses. Um, some of them, some theologians, or some scholars, try to reconcile it. Uh, one of them is Delmas Leroy, or Loa, a Dominican, in his book, Evolution Restricted to Organic Species. Um, he tried to get around it, but he eventually concludes that Adam was the, pro the product of a natural evolution which prepared the earth or mud destined to be a human body for the infusion of the soul. So it sounds like natural transformism. But then we have a letter of his published in a French journal in 1895. He says that his thesis had been examined here in Rome by the competent authority and judged untenable. Above all, for that which refers to the human body, which is incompatible with both scriptural text and with the principles of sound philosophy. So he has a retraction on the basis that the Roman authorities don't agree with evolution. Hmm. We also have another man, uh, John Zom, an American priest, 
in his Evolution and Dogma. And his book's important because as Father Michael Chabrick points out, it's basically the same flavor, if you will, of theistic evolution that we see today, the same points. He tries to claim Augustine and Thomas as proto-evolutionists and all sorts of things. But then for him, we get this letter, also published, requesting his book be withdrawn from sale. He says, I have learned from an irreproachable source that the Holy See is opposed to any further distribution of evolution and dogma. Hmm. So from these things, later theologians in the early 20th century would point to Leroy and Zam and say, look, the index or the holy office must have condemned their books, must have condemned their theses. Therefore, evolution is not compatible with the faith. It's not quite how it happened, but we'll see that in a little bit. What else did church do in response to evolutionism? One of the most important things is the Provincial Council of Cologne. This was held in spring of 1860 by the Cardinal Archbishop uh, Johannes von Geisel. So right after Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species. Now that he held this with the approval of the Pope, Pius IX, the decrees were passed by unanimous vote, and then they were submitted to the Holy See for an official recognitio. Um, this isn't a doctrinal confirmation. It doesn't somehow elevate the council to the level of universal magisterial teaching, sadly. It just confirms that the council was legally, lawfully held, and that there's nothing uh, contrary to faith and moral, nothing against the faith here. There's nothing reproachable in it. But the council did receive personal praise from Pius IX, as well as from the prefect from the congregation of the council. So what did this council say? In the very beginning of its title, number four on man, chapter 14, on the origin of the human race and on the nature of man, it says, our first parents were formed immediately by God, it cites Genesis 2.7. Therefore, we declare that the opinion of those who do not fear to assert that this human being, man as regards his body, emerged finally from the spontaneous, continuous change of imperfect nature to the more perfect, is clearly opposed to sacred scripture and to the faith. Close quote. Bold words. Now, Leroy and later uh, Ernst Messenger, they try to weasel out of this by saying, oh, it only condemns uh, spontaneous change. It doesn't contain, condemn God-driven change. So we can, it only condemns the atheistic variety of transformism. But notice how it says clearly opposed to sacred scripture and the faith, as if scripture itself is clear enough to tell us what the truth is. You know what? The Roman Catechism says the same thing when, after declaring the doctrine of the origin of man's body, it says, quote, from the sacred history of Genesis, the pastor will easily make himself acquainted with these things, the creation of man, for the instruction of the faithful. Now, if the text of Genesis were not so clear that the pastor, your typical pastor, could make himself easily acquainted with these things just by reading it, that implies that the doctrines there contain, that Adam was made by God from the mother of the earth, are to be understood clearly, simply as they sound. Um, and so a lot of theologians after this, such as uh, von Herder, Hervé, Pesch, Huart, um, Bonpensier, they cite this council, this provincial council, as a magisterial authority against evolutionary origin for man, although not a universal authority, it's not infallible. There's also this schema that was prepared for Vatican I. This wasn't promulgated. The council was cut short before they could get to this. But this revised schema, the first half of it, became Dei Filius, almost verbatim, what was published. And it says, Concerning the true nature and origin of man, taught by the divine scriptures, our Holy Mother the Church believes and teaches this. When God was about to make man according to his image and likeness, in order that he might rule over the whole earth, he breathed into the body formed from the mud of the earth, the breath of life, that is, a soul produced from nothing, immaterial, incorruptible, immortal, and gifted with intelligence and free will. And blessing the first man and Eve, his wife, who is formed by divine power from his side, God said, increase and multiply and fill the earth. So, had this decree been promulgated, had the council not been cut short, it would have defined that Adam really was made by God, from the mother of the earth, and Eve by divine power from his side. 
So, but even though this doesn't technically have any direct magisterial authority, since it wasn't promulgated, it does have some indirect authority. Um, as Father Brian Harrison states when he's treating of this document, the council fathers, who, as he says, were drawn from among those regarded by the Holy See as the most learned bishops and the most erudite and trustworthy theologians available. He says, if they were not in a position to know what the ordinary and universal magisterium of the church had been up till their own time, whoever would be. So the fact that the council fathers thought they could define this doctrine shows that it's already contained, at least indirectly shows, in the ordinary and universal magisterium. Let's turn now to some of the neo-scholastic theologians. Um, now, they present the thesis much as we have, where they state the thesis, the body of Adam was formed immediately by God from the mother of the earth, or sometimes they treat both Eve's and Adam's body in the same thesis, just talking about our first parents. Uh, Christian Pesch, a Jesuit, about the turn of the century, in his nine-volume theological manual, he says, in kind of giving us a summary of what happened, among the fathers and theologians, there was always the same judgment. The body of Adam was formed from the mud of, directly formed from the mud of the earth, the body of Eve from that of Adam. And then he goes on. Among the old theologians, there was never any doubt in this matter, but rather all of them, for dogmatic reasons, held that Adam was taken from the dust of the earth and Eve from his side. When, therefore, that new theory was put forward, moderate transformism, almost all theologians immediately gave us their judgment that it cannot be reconciled with Catholic doctrine. Wow. Almost all theologians rejecting evolutionism in favor of the Catholic doctrine. And then he quotes the Council of Cologne. Now, it's true, not all the theologians rejected evolutionism. Some of them, um, like uh, Adolf Tanquery, who's pictured here, and uh, the famous French pe preacher Mont Sabre, they leave the door open for evolution. They don't necessarily see a contradiction. But having examined at least Tanqueray's treatment, it's rather impoverished. There are two cherry-picked quotes from Thomas and Augustine to justify spontaneous generation, and that's about it. A far cry from the pages of citations that you get in other theologians. Now, some will go a step further and they'll say, no, this thesis, this doctrine is common, communis, or certain. So it's a bit stronger theological note which it would at least be a mortal sin of temerity, rashness, to deny, according to uh, Sixtus Cardicini. Some go even further. Evolution is irreconcilable with scripture, and the thesis is perhaps even de fide divina, of divine faith, meaning it's been revealed clearly in scripture and tradition. Um, this would be guys such as Pesch, Hervé, uh, Joseph Lamy, um, and La House. And some go one step further and say that it's Catholic doctrine or even Catholic dogma, such as Johannes Kastauer, uh, Uruburu, Hetzenhauer, Bonponcier, Youngman, Camillo Mazella, they're pictured, and possibly Gary Lagrange. Moreover, uh, several other theologians, Hort, Herder, Berthier, and Chibin, explicitly call evolution heretical. And what's really amazing Despite this wide range of theological notes, different levels of authority assigned to the thesis, almost all of them reject evolutionism in favor for what they frequently say is the, the obvious or the plain sense, the literal sense of Genesis. You've already heard from Pesh. Let's look at what some of the others say. Uh, Hervé says, It is the common and true doctrine of the fathers and theologians that the body of the first man by a special and immediate act was formed by God from pre-existent material with no organic evolution or transformation of species intervening. And also, the fathers unanimously consent in their interpretation of the Mosaic narrative, understanding literally what is contained there concerning the formation of our first parents. All the fathers, excepting perhaps Origen, say that the body of Adam was formed by God from the mud of the earth. Joseph Pohl, the patristic teaching on this subject, is quite unanimous. Francis D. Camp says transformism is altogether foreign to the doctrine of the Holy Fathers. And then he refutes the use of St. Augustine 
in transformism's favor. Uh, Michael Hetzenhauer, he says that transformism is contrary to the constant tradition of the church and to the clear doctrine of Holy Scripture and can be said to be contrary to the faith. Gary Goulagrange gives as the Catholic teaching, saying, According to the common teaching of the fathers and theologians, the body of the first man was formed by a special action of God directly from the slime of the earth without any transformation of species. The fathers and theologians, with the exception of Origen, Cajetan, and a few others, are almost unanimous, or morally unanimous, in their inter interpretation of the teaching of the Bible on the formation of the bodies of our first parents. Von Herder says that transformism is utterly false, and according to Sheeb and heretical, and unheard of in all of Christian antiquity. And Sheban himself says that it is heresy to pretend that man, insofar as his body, uh, as concerns his body, is descended from monkeys. <clears throat> Thomas Lamy, in his excellent two-volume commentary on Genesis, says that all transformists are in error. The reason? He says that the church has always taught that Adam was made from clay, or from the dust of the earth. Palmieri, a Jesuit, after rigorously examining the syntax and the grammar of Genesis 2-7, says that if we consult the fathers, their unanimous consensus in the interpretation of the Mosaic narrative is that it signifies the immediate origin of man by the formative action of God. And truly, none of the fathers can be brought forth who would prelude any part of the opinion of Darwin, and the universal sense of Christians in this matter is sufficiently evident from the argument which the fathers have universally handed down. So he's pointing to the census fidelium too, not just the uh, unanimity of the fathers. Bernard Youngman calls transformism a blasphemous doctrine of unbelievers. And then he goes on to say that the truth which is contained summarily and evidently in the sacred scriptures, it shows from the text already cited above, Genesis 2.7, that God formed the body of Adam from the mud of the earth and gave him life by putting the soul into that body. No less do other texts of sacred scripture show this. For example, Ecclesiasticus, God created man of the earth. We saw that in part one. The Holy Fathers, to a man, all received the history of Moses on the creation of man literally. Without doubt, it is Catholic dogma that the first man was formed immediately by God. And then he cites Lateran IV's uh, Constitution Firmitaire. Catholic dogma. But the best treatment, I think, is from Camillo Cardinal Mazella, a Jesuit, and quite a prodigy, in his 1877 treatise on God the Creator, which was very influential and very thorough. After he introduces the text of Genesis 2-7, he asks the question, of what sort was the divine action by which our first parents were formed? He says the theologians, standing on the authority of sacred scripture, understood from the unanimous interpretation of the Holy Fathers, with one voice respond, that the body of the first man was formed by a direct and immediate act of God, distinct from the first creation of matter, and from the concourse which God, the first cause, produces through the works of secondary causes. So he's saying, unanim unanimity of theologians, unanimity of fathers, standing on the authority of scripture, and no secondary causes. No evolutionary processes. And he further says that all those who are now called transformists or evolutionists are opposed to this doctrine. They're an error. These revive and embellish an old error, saying that God had immediately created matter, or also certain inferior forms, which by a natural and successive action evolved into more and more perfect forms, until thence man himself arose. What's really interesting is that, we don't have time to quote the whole thing, but he then lays out the very same theological framework which we did in part one. It says that some things can be believed with divine faith and also Catholic faith. And it's sufficient for Catholic faith, quoting Vatican I, for something to be taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And then he quotes to us Labenter, pointing to the unanimous consent of the theologians as being a clear witness that a doctrine has been taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. And of course, he cites Suarez in saying that it's Catholic doctrine. After giving all that, he says that if the doctrine here discussed, even if it were not de fide, which we hardly concede, it nevertheless would not follow that it is licit to deny it. Because there are other theological censors, maybe less than 
heretical, that you still aren't justified in believing. Like, approximate to heresy, erroneous, temerarious, it would still be gravely sinful to assent to these things, even if there's a lesser theological note. But he does, he's saying we hardly concede that. We want to say it's of Catholic faith. It's de fide. And he concludes with his proposition. He says, Our first parents, as follows from divine revelation, were formed immediately by God, not only as regards the soul, but also as regards the body. Those who are now called transformists labor in vain to overthrow or weaken this most certain truth. So Mazzella seems to think that the thesis is de fide. And of course, he cites a bunch of the fathers and theologians. Before moving on, I want to quote one other theologian, a certain father, Jeremiah Murphy. Um, unfortunately, I can't seem to find any biographical information on him. Other than that, he wrote prolifically against another theistic evolutionist in the late 1800s, uh, a Dr. Mivart, who's an English biologist. Listen to what Murphy says, because it's an apt summary of everything we've seen so far. Here we have an unbroken chain of authentic testimony from fathers, theologians, pastors, and doctors teaching with most extraordinary unanimity the sense of a certain revealed statement, that such teaching is a certain proof of the truth of the doctrine so taught is held universally by Catholic theologians, and then he cites a bunch. Thus then we have on one hand a consensus of fathers and theologians teaching the immediate formation of God by of the body of Adam, of the first man, and this by an act distinct from the creation of matter or from his cooperation with nature's laws, a doctrine that is incompatible with evolution applied to man. And we have, on the other hand, absolutely certain authority for holding that such a consensus is conclusive proof for the doctrine so taught. Such a consensus is the voice of the ordinary magisterium of the church, and the doctrine so taught is part of the divine deposit of faith infallibly true. And as the evolution theory applied to man contradicts this doctrine, that theory is false and against faith. This is the difficulty that confronts Mr. Mivart. It is not all the individual concrete priest that is opposed to him. It is the infallible authority of the magisterium, or of the consensus patrum, in the proper technical sense of these terms. Close quote. Whew. Infallibly true. But as bold as that is, he was missing something. The other theologians were missing something. So what I'm about to talk about next comes principally from these two books, Negotiating Darwin and Chabarik's Catholicism and Evolution. Now, uh, Negotiating Darwin is a really good uh, historical treatment. It's very thorough, but it does seem to favor evolutionism, and it's not very sensitive to some of the theological arguments that I uncovered. Chabarik's book, kind of summarizing the former, is more theologically sensitive, although he doesn't, he certainly rejects evolutionism, but he doesn't quite seem to get the whole young earth thing yet. Um, so in 1998, the Vatican archives were opened, and investigators, like the authors that negotiating Darwin, found some interesting material related to the origins debate. They found that the Roy and Zom, who we saw before, they did, in fact, have their books condemned, but the decrees were never published, which is interesting. Um, but they also found these lengthy theological analyses commissioned by the index in, to investigate these books, which want to look a little bit at their arguments. So against Dalmas Leroy, you have Luigi Trepepi's 54-page analysis theological analysis. He later became a cardinal. He says, fo he follows Mazzella quite co closely, and Mazzella was actually on the congregation. He was there for this con uh, condemnation. Uh, he says, quoting Mazzella, that the fathers and theologians are unanimous, that man's body was made immediately by God. He also says that Adam's body had no life prior to the infusion of the soul, which is exactly what St. Thomas says. And therefore, it could not have been made from something already living, an animal. It had to be made from inorganic matter. And then lastly, he again, he cites De Filius, like we did in part one, and Tuas Labenter, and he says that it is, seems clear to me, with all that has been said, that the doctrine generally professed by the church is clear. Even though these matters have not yet been defined dogmatically, transformism, 
if it is limited only to the origin of the human body prepared and destined to receive the soul does not seem reconcilable with Catholic doctrine. Now, the ultimate result of this investigation was that Leroy, he would be asked to retract publicly through his Dominican superiors, but the decree wouldn't be published, kind of out of deference to the Dominicans because they were having a hard time and the order is so venerable. And Leroy did indeed retract, as we saw. But then he tried again. He revised his book and resubmitted it to the index, saying, okay, is this any better? And it wasn't. We had a different consultor this time, another Dominican, Enrico Bonponcier, a 56-page analysis. And he basically says the same thing as Trepepe, but a little more forceful. Um, now, Leroy says, quote, As for Adam, God di intervened directly, created a human soul, then infused or breathed it into an animal, and gave to this soul the extraordinary power of instantaneously transforming this organism into a human body. So that's Leroy. Bonpensier responds, It is quite clear that scripture, understood according to the doctrine of the Holy Fathers, excludes, with the exception of the efficiency of God and the passivity of the humus, which is the Latin word for dirt, any other action by secondary causes in the formation of the first man. And it is very profitable that this interpretation of Genesis, given by the Fathers, is in accord with Catholic truth and doctrine, as Albertus Magnus and Suarez say explicitly. And we saw both those citations in part one. And then he cites the Council of Cologne, and he says, I do not see how any Catholic writer could defend the system of limited evolution, even though limited to Adam's body only. So, obviously, Leroy was told that his new book uh, wasn't approved. But Bonpensier shows up again with the case against Zom, and this one's a little more complicated. Because Zom wasn't just an evolutionist, he was an Americanist. Um, the Americanist crisis was going on at about the same time, and he had some very powerful friends, a number of American bishops. Um, so, Bonpensier, in his new analysis on Zom's book, after 44 pages tearing apart Zom's thesis, refuting the idea that Thomas and Augustine were evolutionists and whatnot, he offers his own thesis and says, in all capital letters, I think it is Catholic doctrine to state that God had immediate, made Adam immediately and directly from the mud of the earth. And then he goes on to give seven pages of citations to the fathers and theologians to justify this. After laying out his theological, his exegetical rules for scripture, which comes straight from Providentissimus Deus, paragraph 15, he then says, Now then, the unanimous agreement of the church fathers and scholastic theologians in matters of faith and morals bears certain witness to Catholic dogma, just as Melchior Cano, among others, instructs. Thus, the truth of the conclusion presented above is sustained. So he's arguing it's Catholic dogma against Psalm. And the book was, in fact, condemned. He even suggested that the Holy Office go on to condemn the error of evolutionism, um, condemn a proposition, although there doesn't seem to be any evidence that that happened, sadly. Probably because when Zom got wind that his book was under the gun, there was a very long and calculated campaign to stall or prevent the publication of the decree. He was asked to retract and remove his book from sale, which he did almost accidentally. But at the end of the day, Leo XIII said, okay, we'll not publish the decree until Zom comes to Rome. But he never did. And Leo XIII died, and the case in a certain way, was never closed. But there's one other thing that we found when the archives were opened in 1998, a book that went entirely unnoticed, and this decree was published. It's a book, really a collection of articles by Father Raffaello Caverni, New Studies in Philosophy. His basic thesis is that evolution is reconcilable with Catholicism. Um, but he proposes a lot of erroneous views on scripture and tradition, which have since been uh, condemned in various encyclicals. So, he was denounced to the index by the Archbishop of Florence, and the consultor for this case, like we had Trepepi and Bonfoncier before, uh, with the other cases, this one was Tommaso Zigliara, another Dominican. He's important. And he wrote a 19-page report. Now, Trepepi, who's on the Leroy case, was also present for this, 
So when condemning Leroy, he pointed back in his analysis to the condemnation of Caverny. And the general congregation of the index unanimously voted to condemn the book. But listen to what they say in their closing report. This work merits serious and special attention. In it, Darwinism is expounded and partly approved, stating that it has many points of contact with a religious doctrine, especially with Genesis and other books of the Bible. Until now, the Holy See has rendered no decision on the system mentioned. Therefore, if Caverny's work is condemned, as it should be, Darwinism would be indirectly condemned. Surely there would be cries against this decision. The example of Galileo would be brought, held up. It would be said that this holy congregation is not competent to emit judgments on physiological and ontological doctrines or theories of change. But we should not focus on this probable clamor. With this system, Darwinism destroys the basis of revelation and openly teaches pantheism and an abject materialism. Thus, an, an indirect condemnation of Darwin is not only useful, but even necessary, together with that of Caverni, his defender and propagator among the Italian youth. That decree was published. And once more, this report when it was brought before Leo XIII, which was customary when such a thing is to be promulgated, goes to the Pope. This decree was most likely read to Leo XIII, and he approved it in uh, July of 1878. So we have the Pope approving the index, giving an indirect condemnation of Darwinism, and no one knew about it, more or less, until 1998. And even though the condemnation itself seems to have been ineffectual, because no one knew about it, nothing in what was actually published says that it was for evolutionism, that the book was condemned, and nothing in the title of the book says so, so it just went by the wayside. Even though that's the case, that doesn't mean it's not binding anymore. doesn't mean the church's authority doesn't stand in this indirect condemnation. Now fast forward a year and a half. Zigliara, the uh, consultor, he's made a cardinal. He was actually a very good friend of Leo XIII's and an opponent of evolutionism. Leo XIII had actually ordained him back in the day. He was also a leading neo-Thomist. And Leo then went on to make him the superintendent of the Leonine edition of St. Thomas's works, the official Vatican edition of St. Thomas. And then Leo promulgates Arcanum a year and a half later, barely two years into his papacy. And I imagine all this, this indirect condemnation of Darwinism, was on the back of his mind as he wrote this, Defending Marriage, which I hope we're all familiar with by now. The true origin of marriage, venerable brethren, is well known to all. The revilers of the Christian faith refuse to acknowledge the never-interrupted doctrine of the church on this subject, and have long striven to destroy the testimony of all nations in all times. They have nevertheless failed to quench the powerful light of truth, but even to lessen it. We record what is to all known and cannot be doubted by any, that God, on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth, and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave to him a companion, whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam, when he was locked in sleep. Now, there's two interesting points here. Um, the first is that, as Father Brian Harrison notes, and I confirmed with my own research, it doesn't seem that a single theologian noticed this and reference to origins. As a matter of fact, there seems to be hardly any scholarship, to quite recently, on Arcanum at all. My, my, uh, I theorize that the promulgation of Eterni Patris just a couple months before with the restoration of Christian philosophy on which there's a colossal amount of scholarship kind of took center stage and then our economy just went by the wayside. But Father Harrison, he points out that, oh, this is what the CDF calls a confirmation or a reaffirmation that the doctrine is contained in the ordinary and universal magisterium. He doesn't use those words, but it's very clear from the tenor of his words. It's a doctrine of Christian faith never interrupting the doctrine of the church, known to all, cannot be doubted by any. What is this but the testimony of the church, the teaching of the church, the ordinary and universal magisterium? He's just pointing to it, saying, hey, this doctrine is contained here. Now, you might object that, oh, he's talking about marriage. He's not talking about origins. That's the point. If you read the encyclical and some of his previous uh, letters dealing with marriage, he makes it very clear from the tradition that the origin of human marriage is the origin of human nature. They are one and the same. 
God instituted marriage when he instituted human nature in the same act. That's why our Lord says in Matthew 19, have you not read in Genesis that when God made them in the beginning, he made them male and female. God making man and God making marriage were done at the same time in the same act. You cannot separate the two. And that's why this is so important. Now there's one other thing which went unnoticed, and I think is the most important of all. The profession of faith of Pope Pelagius I in the 6th century. Now, to be fair, there is one theologian in the late 50s who did recognize it, but even though he says, if the sources are to be taken in their obvious sense, the doctrines de fide, he then backtracks and says, well, later scientific confirmation of evolution could reduce the authority or the value of the theological arguments, which is balderdash. This is a theological truth. It's a revealed truth. It has supernatural certitude. Scientific arguments can't say poo. Scientific arguments can't diminish the authority of the theological sources. That's modernism. But that's the only guy who mentions it, uh, uh, Father uh, Saguez. Other than that, it was not widely known until the late 50s because all his letters were in these dispersed collections and they weren't brought together until then. And it doesn't even show up in the Denzinger into the 60s. And by then, no one cared. Now, Pelagius, he was involved in what's known as the Three Chapters Controversy, which is really complicated. Um, and it wound up being resolved, more or less, at the Second Con Council of Constantinople, Fifth Ecumenical Council. At first, Pelagius had defended the Three Chapters. But then, after the Council condemned them, he was made Pope, and he condemns the Chapters. Schism erupts. The Italian and North African bishops are saying, no, Pelagius is going against the first four ecumenical councils. He's not in accordance with the faith in condemning this. Um, some even said he conspired in the death of his predecessor. All these calumnies against his faith are going around. So the king, one of the Frankish kings, Childebert I, sends a legate to him and says, hey, we want a clarification. We want to know where your faith is. So he sends a letter, ironically called Humani Generis, to which he attaches a profession of faith. But then he sent it again, the same profession, perhaps a little expanded, in another letter to the universal church, Vas Alexionis. So what does this letter say? When he gets to the section on the resurrection, he says that, I believe and confess that all men who have been born and have died from the time of Adam up to the consummation of the world along with Adam himself and his wife, who were not born of other parents, but were created, one from the earth, the other, however, from the rib of man, will then rise again. Put a bookmark there, because he's talking about this in relation to the resurrection, and he's not the only patristic author who does so. But like I said, no one seems to have recognized the value of this document, this statement from Pelagius, until the 50s. Father Harrison um, noticed it in the late 90s, early 2000s, and he kind of gives a cursory analysis and says, well, it seems to be of high authority, but probably not infallible. But then, in the Sacra Theologiae Summa, in the section written by Father Joachim Salaveri, he lists, following the authority of another theologian, uh, Carlo Silva Taruca, 20 true definitions ex cathedra between the years... 380 and 870. And number 14 is this. The profession of faith of Pope Pelagius I at Childebertus, king of the Franks. I about fell out of my chair. He's saying that the profession of faith of Pope Pelagius is ex cathedra. It's defined. That's huge. But I couldn't get access to the books, so I did a bit more poking. Who's right? Is Father Harrison right or Father Salaveri right? Now, more research does need to be done. There are a couple books that I'm trying to get my hands on. But I looked into the texts of the Humani Generis, the Vasa Lexionis, and the actual Profession of Faith itself. Now, it's sent, the Profession of Faith was sent attached to the Vasa Lexionis to the entire church. That's to whom the letter is addressed. So that's a note of universality, which is requisite for an ex cathedra definition. That's one of the four requirements. Pelagius says in that letter, his intention, that I may define by profession of faith, by profession my faith, attached below, 
in which, by God's grace, it may be manifestly clear that I follow in the footsteps of the correct doctrine of the apostles and fathers. So he says, define my faith. I mean, that might be anachronistic to say it's an infallible definition, but okay, so that one's tentative. And we also have the note of on faith and morals. So that's three of the four. But then at the end of the letter, he says this. This then is my faith and my hope, which is in me by the gift of God's mercy. But whosoever will hold, believe, or preach otherwise, him the holy and universal church of God anathematizes. If that is not evidence for a solemn definition, an ex cathedra definition, I don't know what is. In which case, what he said about the origin of Adam and Eve, who are not made of other parents, one from the earth, the other from the side, is defined divine and Catholic faith, a defined dogma. You can't get any higher than that. But let's just say for the sake of argument that I'm wrong. Let's say that, okay, I'm wrong. It's not an ex cathedra decision. Father Harrison was right. What do we have? So we have this high authority papal decision, possibly ex cathedra. We have 19 centuries of uninterrupted tradition. The scriptures are explicit. The tradition is unanimous. Fathers and theologians, they say Adam was immediately created by God from mud, dust mixed with water. We also have the rejection by these fathers and theologians of non-literal, non-historical interpretations of Genesis 2, especially on the origin of our first parents. We have an indirect condemnation of Darwinism by the Holy See. And we have a possible confirmation that the doctrine is contained in the ordinary and universal magisterium by Leo XIII in Arcanum. When you add all of this up, what else is this but the infallible teaching of the ordinary and universal magisterium? I don't see any way around it. So, as we continue to fight to restore the foundations of Catholic truth, or rather, as we strive to cooperate with our Lord and our Blessed Mother, as they work to restore His truth, it belongs to Him, we can have complete and supernatural confidence, the highest degree of certitude possible, in the veracity and the true sense of the words which our Holy Mother of the Church annually and solemnly repeats to us, quoting the very words of God who solemnly revealed this doctrine to our First Father. Memento homo quia pulvises, et in pulverem revertris. Remember, O man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.